A continuous signal can be seen as a real or complex valued function of an independent variable. In this course, the independent variable will always be time, but in reality you have to deal with signals which are a function of time, space variables, or a mix of time and space variables. The terms continuous time and analog will be used interchangeably in this course. A function is said to be even if it meets the following property for all times. Okay, so it says that a function at time t, so let's pick a time over here. Okay, so this is t. Well, the function at times t is equal to, well, the function at time minus t. So let's say this is minus t over here. And these values here are the same okay and this is true for any t this means that well if you look at the graph of an uneven function it is symmetric around the vertical axis an example of an even function is a cosine and here what you see on the screen is a cosine of period t other examples of even functions are all polynomial functions as long as the powers in the polynomials are even. A function is said to be odd when it meets the following equation for all times t. So a function at time t, let's take it over here, t is equal to the function at time minus t but with a change of sign over here okay so if this is true for all t you see that in the graph of an odd function you will see symmetry around the origin a typical odd function is the sine function this is the function that is represented here on the screen a sine of period t other examples are polynomial functions but where the powers are odd every continuous time function can be represented as the sum of an even component and an odd component this is done by decomposing f of t in the following fashion here you see that this equation certainly holds because if we combine the terms here in blue you have indeed f of t and the terms here in red well they compensate one another and they give zero okay so by combining the two first terms we obtain the even component and by combining the two last terms we obtain the odd components and we see that this is indeed the even component because you see that it meets the following property which is standard for even functions okay and this one meets the following relation which is characteristic for odd functions so in this slide we consider time shifting by a quantity tau and in the drawing that you've got here tau is assumed to be positive so what you've got here is f of t and here we have the signal g of t which is a delayed version of f of t by a quantity tau and you see here that in t equals tau g of tau is equal to f of zero okay so you can immediately see that when tau is positive this leads to a shift to the right okay so in this case g of t is lagging f of t if you would choose a tau that is negative you would have a shift to the left and then g of t would be leading f of t a function is said to be periodic with period t if it is the infinite repetition of some motive defined on an interval t 
So you have here an example of a function f of t that is periodic of period t. And you can see that if you shift this function, uh, if let's say that we shift it to the right by t, then we obtain the same function. If we shift it by two times the period, again we obtain the same function. If we shift it to the left, okay, then we have the same function. So this leads us to our definition of periodicity with a period t. This holds if for all t, for all times and any integer k, the following equation holds. And this equation says that if you shift the function by k times the period, you obtain the same function again. So what is shown here is that the function f of t is constructed from a motive, okay, and this motive is constructed based on a function g of t, which is 1 minus t square here, and we use the motive over an interval. Okay, so the interval here is minus 1, 1, and outside that interval, we set the motive to 0. Okay, so we'll be able to construct a periodic function by shifting this motive an infinite number of times and by adding all those shifted uh, versions of the motive. And you can see here that the period will be the length of the interval in your motive, and this will be t equals. 2 over here. So how can you obtain the periodic function f of t based on the motive? Well, you can start by adding the motive but shift it to the right by a one period. And if you do this, this is what you obtain. Okay. If you add another term which corresponds to the original motive but shifted to the left, this is what you obtain. And if you keep on adding motives but shifted by k times the period for any integer k, you obtain the periodic function that is shown on screen. So mathematically, this is how this is written, okay? So you start from the motive and you consider all possible shifted versions of this motive, shifted by an integer k times the period. And if you take all these shifted versions and you add them, you obtain a periodic function. This will be used several times in the course and you'll have to recognize at some stage that a function is indeed periodic because it's constructed based on an infinite amount of motives that are shifted and summed. Time scaling transforms the function f of t into the function g of t equals to f of a t okay and we assume here that a is any positive number that is non-zero okay so we see that in t equals one over a okay g over one over a is equal to f of one okay so if a is positive but smaller than one one over a will be higher than one and we see that we have expansion okay on the contrary if a is larger than one then we see that one over a is smaller than one and then we have compression 
one way of seeing this is by considering for instance the function g of t is equal to sine a t okay so this would be the same as an f of t which is sine of t and you see that if a is larger than one you have a higher frequency so in the time domain you have indeed a compression okay whereas in the previous example with a smaller than one you would have a smaller frequency and you would have expansion time reversal or time reflection transforms the function f of t into a function g of t that is equal to f of minus t so this will be my f of t over here and this will be g of t so let us consider uh, time t this one and we see indeed that g of t is equal to f of t at the time minus t okay since this has to be true for every t we see that we obtain g of t by simply mirroring f of t with respect to the vertical y-axis time reversal will be used to compute the convolution integral later in the course so now you can start combining time reversal or time reflection with time shifting here to the right and time shifting here to the left i'll consider this one with you and i'll leave you this one as an exercise okay let's consider this function and try to find out how it looks with respect to the original function f of t first thing that you can see is that you have a minus sign in front of the t so there is time reversal and you see indeed that this one has to be mirrored to obtain what you see over here but there has also been of course a time shifting and now you have to know is it a time shifting to the left or a time shifting to the right so the easiest thing is to look at the value of t which makes the argument zero and it's t is equal to minus tau and now you know that in t is equal to minus tau your function will have the same value as the original function in zero okay this is time t equals zero and the function takes the value one so in t is equal to minus tau you know that the value takes the the function takes the value one and you see now that you have a shifting to the left another way to to do this is to write this function as f of minus t plus tau okay so now you can see that the first thing that you do is reverse the function and do time reversal and you shift it by a quantity tau to the left so this is something we have just discussed and now i want to make a note on advancing reflecting and delaying signals in real times so suppose that we have here the time axis and that we have a function f of t and that we can draw this function and i'll draw it so that i can easily delay and advance it we have this function f of t available up to time t over here okay so i would like to construct in real time this means that i need to construct it based on the information that i have on time t a delayed version of this function this is possible because if I delay, I shift everything to the right by a quantity tau and I'll obtain my function 
well, something like that. F T minus tau, and all the information is available to construct it. And I would even be able to kind of predict the value of this function in the future. Okay, suppose now that I'm asked to construct an advanced version of my function f of t and let's advance everything again by a quantity tau okay this is tau this will be problematic because we'll be able to construct the function up to time t minus tau but we need to construct it up to time t so this means that here we would have to take values in the future and this is clearly not possible so we cannot construct an advanced version of f of t in real time and for the same reasons it will be impossible to construct a reflected version of a function so what we'll do now is construct a library of basic functions that we'll be using in this course and the first signal is the Dirac impulse it's not really a function it will be called a distribution so we start from a rectangular impulse of duration epsilon and this uh, rectangular impulse is non-zero in the interval minus epsilon over 2 epsilon over 2 and it is zero outside this interval okay notice also that the impulse starts at minus epsilon over 2 so this function is non-causal a causal function means that the function is zero whenever t is smaller than zero so clearly this rectangular impulse is non-causal this is because in this course we'll be sometimes working with non-causal signals okay and this also means that the resulting Dirac impulse will be a little bit different than the one that you've seen in previous courses well this rectangular impulse is constructed in such a way that it has a unit area so it has duration epsilon and amplitude 1 over epsilon so this means that the surface under the curve here is 1 and now we consider this rectangular impulse when we let epsilon tend to 0 and in the limit this is indicated by this equation what we obtain is the Dirac impulse or the Dirac distribution well the Dirac impulse will be symbolized like this it's an arrow of length 1 and why does it have length 1 well because in the limit as we will see in the next slide the surface or the area below the delta remains 1 so this leaves us with the following properties the Dirac impulse is zero everywhere except in t equals zero where the Dirac impulse is not defined note that we say not defined this is not the same as saying that uh, the value of the impulse is infinite at t equals zero this is incorrect to say it correctly you need to say that the delta is not defined for t equals zero and we had seen that our rectangular impulse was constructed in such a way that it had a unit area well in the limiting case we preserve this property and the integral over integration limits minus a a of the delta is equal to one as long as a is larger than zero of course so another very important property is the sifting property and in french we call it la propriété de localisation and it says the following so let's draw a reference frame here and suppose that we have a 
continuous signal at time t equals zero and I'll call this signal f of t and that we multiply it with a Dirac impulse this will be my Dirac impulse well you can immediately see that the product of the two will be zero everywhere except at times well at time t equals zero so it means that the result will indeed be an impulse again and the result is actually an impulse that has been modulated by the function f of t and this impulse is f0 this means the original function evaluated at times t equals 0 times delta t so how can you obtain this result well you can start from this rectangular impulse delta epsilon here that is an approximation of delta it's shown here in blue and if you multiply it by f of t what you obtain over here is the curve in purple and if you let now epsilon tend to zero you see that this becomes infinitely thin and that this expression will tend to this one f of t will look a lot like the value of f of t evaluated at t equals zero okay and this will tend to f of zero delta t okay so very important we'll be using this quite often the sifting property so what we do here is generalize the sifting property if you look at the equation that is on the screen and you take it for t0 is equal to 0 you'll obtain the sifting property of the previous slide so what we do here is take a delta that is located at t equals 0 and we multiply it by a function f of t so the function f of t is required here to be continuous at time t equals 0 we multiply it by the delta and here is the delta you can see that the delta is located at t equals t zero and the product of course will be zero everywhere except in t equals t zero this is why the result will also be a delta okay a delta located in t0 but it will be modulated by the function f of t so the result will be a delta located at t equals t0 and modulated by the function at t equals to 0 so the result will be this thing over here okay this is precisely what is indicated over here what i often see at the time of the exam is that i get something like this okay this is obviously not correct because this is a constant signal okay if you multiply the function f of t by a delta it must be zero everywhere except at times t equals zero so this is incorrect so what we see here is the generic representation of a continuous signal and this will be used later on in the course to obtain the convolution integral okay this is an equality and you can well, kind of prove this equality by using the sifting property and this will be the first time that we use it but it will certainly not be the last time so we integrate over tau here okay so we have to consider all functions as a function of the variable tau and our delta here is located in tau equals t okay so we can use the sifting property and say that this thing over here is a delta 
located at the same spot with the function evaluated at tau equals t okay so inside the integral i can replace this quantity over here by this thing over here and this is precisely what has been done over here this is because of the sifting property we integrate over the variable tau this function here is independent of tau so we can take it out of the integral this is how you obtain this expression over here and this is equal to 1 over here because we know that the surface below uh, delta is 1 and this remains true of course even if this delta is shifted so we have shown that this expression is equal to f of t so what we have done right now is prove this relation mathematically but you can also look at it in a more intuitive way so let us draw a reference frame so here i will see t and here f of t and here is my function f of t so what we can do is look at the time t equals tau and we know that this is f of tau delta t minus tau this is exactly what we have here inside the integral what we can do now is use similar Dirac functions that are spaced by delta tau and we can start summing this you can see that if delta tau is going to zero tending to zero if you take all those deltas and you sum them well they will start to look a lot like the function f of t okay and if delta t tends to zero instead of using a sum you'll be using an integral okay so this is the intuition that is behind this formula over here f of t can be decomposed as an infinite sum of deltas right next to the other that are all modulated by the function at the spot where the delta is located so the next signal in our library is the unit step or heavy side function and it will be denoted u of t so in this course whenever you see u of t it's a unit step and this new signal is obtained by integration of the Dirac impulse so what we'll do is start from the rectangular impulse that we had used to approximate the Dirac impulse okay we integrate it and then we'll look at what happens when epsilon is going to tend to zero okay remember that if we tend epsilon let uh, epsilon tend to zero then what you obtain here is the dirac impulse so let us integrate this function over here to the left of minus epsilon over two it's zero so of course we have zero over here here in this interval minus epsilon over two epsilon over two interval of width epsilon we integrate something that is constant okay so we're going to have an increase that is linear and the slope will be one over epsilon okay so the slope here is one over epsilon okay so after integrating for a period of epsilon with a slope of one over epsilon this means that here at t equals epsilon over 2 the value is 1 and then over here well what we integrate falls back to 0 so the output must be constant and it remains 1
okay so now it's kind of obvious what will happen if we let epsilon go to zero this is going to be the resulting uh, signal and it's called the unit step or heavy side function so we have seen that the unit step is the integral of the dirac impulse and we had obtained our approximation of the unit step graphically it was zero to the left of minus epsilon over two one to the right of epsilon over two and in between it was an increasing function with a slope of one over epsilon you can see here that if t is equal to minus epsilon over two this will lead to zero you have a kind of a continuity and when t is equal to epsilon over 2 this will reduce to 1 so you have also continuity on this side so now we can have a look at what happens when epsilon is going to tend to 0 well this interval here will reduce to t equals 0 okay so now we can have a look at u of t okay when t is equal to zero and u of t corresponds to this function here when epsilon is going to tend to zero so when epsilon going to tend to zero we have to consider everything at t equals zero this is not going to give me a contribution and we see here that in the limit we'll have u of zero is equal to a half okay this may come as a surprise but if you look here you can already see that u of epsilon of t is always equal to a half at time t equals zero so in the limit it will also be true for u of t so you will have u of zero is equal to a half this is different to the unit step that you have encountered in previous courses this is simply because we have here considered uh, an approximation of the delta that is non-causal it starts at minus epsilon over two so here are some properties of the unit step we have already seen that to the left of t equals zero the unit step is zero to the right of t equals zero it's one and at times t equals zero the value is a half we have already seen that u of t is the integral of the dirac impulse so this means that the derivative of the unit step is the dirac impulse okay so this equation holds here so this means that the derivative is zero everywhere except at time t equals zero that's kind of logical because it's at times t equals zero that the unit step has a discontinuity so a useful property of the unit step is that it can turn a non causal function into a causal function remember that causal functions take the value zero to the left of t equals zero so let us take a non-causal function okay sine of t obviously it's non-zero when t is to the left of t equals zero but if you multiply it with a unit step you turn it into a causal signal because you know that u of t is zero when t is to the left of t equals zero so the mathematically correct representation of a unit step is the following one this means here that when you approach t equals zero from the left well you will tend to a value of zero this is the left limit which is zero if you approach t equals zero from the right 
well u of t will tend to 1 this is the right limit and if you consider u of t at t equals 0 it will be a half so of course i will not always use this representation of the previous slide and i will prefer an oscilloscope representation of the unit step as shown here on the screen it's the heavy side function as it would appear on an oscilloscope you know that u of t is not a continuous uh, function and it has a jump at time t equals zero so from your previous courses on calculus you know that this function should not have a derivative but here in this course we say well the derivative of the unit step is a function called the dirac impulse so this should make you a little bit suspicious about this Dirac impulse and indeed the Dirac impulse and I've said it before is not a function it's a distribution this can all be formalized using the theory of distributions but this goes beyond the scope of this course signals with jump discontinuities can be represented as the sum of continuous signals and unit step signals at the discontinuities. This can be useful for computing the derivatives of these signals. So let us illustrate this. As usual, I'm drawing the reference frame over here. And I will take a signal over here, f of t, and at time t equals t0, it will have a jump discontinuity so what you can do is consider two signals the first one that I'm drawing over here it's the original signal up to times t equal to 0 and then it's constant afterwards okay so this one I will call it f1t and you can consider another one that corresponds to the original signal to the right of t0 and that is constant before t0 and you can see that these signals are both continuous okay so my original signal it's f of t okay well you can rewrite it as f1 t u t0 minus t plus f2 of t u t minus t0 okay so this term over here will pick the blue curve up to time t equals to zero and since we multiply by this quantity over here we will have something that is zero to the right of t zero okay and this term over here will pick the right part so the part of f of t that is to the right of t equals t0 well the next signal in our library of basic functions is the unit ramp and here you have a representation okay what you can say is that as the unit step is the integral of the Dirac impulse well the unit ramp is the integral of the unit step okay another way to see this unit ramp is that it is a function t okay that is made causal by multiplication by a unit step okay so this means that it will be zero to the left of t equals zero and it will be t okay whatever the time t to the right of t equals zero obviously the following relations hold and the first one is that the derivative of the ramp the unit ramp is 
the unit step. This is simply saying, well, that the derivative to the left here is zero. It's kind of obvious. And to the right of t equals zero, the derivative is one. The slope is one. Okay, so indeed we obtain that the derivative of the unit ramp is the unit step. And if you take the second derivative, well, you kind of see that the second derivative is zero everywhere except at t equals t zero because here there is this discontinuity in the slope. So the next signal that is useful for this course is the rectangular impulse window function and it can be constructed from unit steps. So it is drawn over here and you can see that it has a duration of one and an amplitude of one so the area below the rectangular impulse is one so if you integrate it okay from minus infinity to infinity you have one over here so you can construct it using two unit steps this one over here uh, we'll draw it over here so here it is okay so this is the first one over here and I can draw the second one in another column and I will take the minus sign with it so it will be something that is like this okay so this is the second one over here and if you add both of them of course you have the resulting rectangular impulse it can also be described like this but this is not so important for this course so this is a rectangular impulse centered at t equals zero of amplitude one and duration one so what you can do is use some properties that we've seen previously to obtain a rectangular impulse of duration t, amplitude a, and centered in t equals tau. Okay, well the easiest thing is to obtain an amplitude of A. What you need it to do is to take your original rectangular impulse and multiply it by A. In order to center it in T equals tau, well you need to use this time shifting property. Okay, this is what you see over here. And one if you want to give it a length or a duration t here you need to use the scaling property and this is the one over t that you see over here so if you have a if you want a t that is larger than one you will see that this will do the job because a one over t will then be smaller than one and what we'll have to here is multiplying by something that is smaller than one and what you'll have is expansion okay so this is indeed the case so what we have done here is basically construct a rectangular impulse that we use as a basis and then if we want another rectangular impulse we construct it from the properties time shifting time scaling and simply multiplication so you can also construct a triangular impulse using the ramp function and this triangular impulse is shown over here well it has a width of two okay and an amplitude of one over here so again the area below the curve will be one so if you integrate this triangular impulse from minus infinity to infinity it gives you one okay so this triangular impulse is constructed from shifted ramp uh, signals okay and i will show you 
like I did in the previous example. So the first term over here is a ramp signal that has been shifted to the left so that it starts here at minus one and it will do something like this. Okay, so this is this term over here. So if we take the second term over here and I'll again take the minus sign with it you have minus two ramp signals so the slope will be minus one here the slope was one and now i need to draw something with a negative slope of minus two and that starts at t equals zero. So my second term here will be something like this. Okay, and the slope is minus two over here. Okay, this corresponds to the second term. And there is a third term over here. And this is simply a ramp signal that is shifted to the right so this third term if you draw it gives you something like this okay and here the slope is one again so if you add these three functions here one two and three what you obtain is the original triangular impulse okay you see here that the slope is indeed one here we have a slope of one there minus two so it gives you a slope of minus one okay and from here on here we have a slope of one there is slope of one and here a slope of minus two so the slope will be zero so the signal will be constant Okay, so this is again a triangular impulse that is centered in zero of with duration two, amplitude one. So if you want to change the duration to 2t, change the amplitude to a and center it in tau, well, again, what you'll do is use the shifting property, the scaling property, and multiply by this constant. The next function in the library is the exponential impulse window function defined as follows. When a is positive, well, this function is exponentially decreasing. It is also causal because we have multiplied the exponential using this unit step. What can we say about this function? Well, because of these properties of the unit step, epsilon in zero is a half right what we see here is the oscilloscope view so in reality things look like this this is what you see over here and you have a limit to the right and a limit to the left right so this limit to the right is the limit when t tends to zero from above, so from the right of epsilon t, and this is one, will denote it epsilon zero plus, right? So we have a one over here. We can now compute the derivative, so epsilon prime. We have two factors over here, so we'll have two terms in the derivative. It's minus a exponential of minus a t u of t and then exponential of minus a t times the derivative of this one and this is a delta right this one we can rewrite differently we have to use the sifting property which says that f of t delta t is f of zero this is f of t evaluated where the delta is located and this delta is located in zero so it is equal to f of zero delta t 
this one evaluated in zero is a one so you can replace this one by delta t and this is simply saying that you have a discontinuity over here so the slope is not defined in zero because of this delta t what we can do is again look at this limit to the right of the slope and therefore only this term will play a role and this is minus a right we'll denote this epsilon prime zero plus so the slope here of this tangent is minus a therefore if you have a positive increase horizontally of one over a you have a decrease of minus one okay so this tangent here meets the time axis in one over a and epsilon in one over a is the exponential of minus a when t is equal to one over a and this is the exponential of minus one so this is indeed correct you can also compute the area below this exponential impulse window function and this is given by this expression but since this impulse window is causal we can replace this integration bound by zero right so if we integrate this one we have exponential of minus a t divided by minus a and the integration bounds are zero infinity so you have zero minus minus one over a so this is indeed correct and this exponential impulse window function at least when a is positive so that it is exponentially decreasing can be used to dampen a causal signal right and dampen is amortir in french so the next signal in our library is the Dirac comb or in French le peigne de Dirac and it's an infinite series of Dirac impulses that are spaced at an interval of t so it's a periodic signal of period t and it can be denoted like this so if you remember how you can construct a periodic function using a motive well this formula should be very clear to you okay the motive here will be the delta function the Dirac impulse okay you can see here that well if you take one delta you have this and now if you add a delta that is shifted to the right by t you obtain this if you add one that is shifted to the left by t you obtain this and then of course you can keep on going on and you obtain something like this okay so this diracom is constructed from the motive right which is the dirac impulse and it's obtained by shifting this delta impulse by a number of times the period which is k here huh? k times the period shifting to the left and to the right by using the appropriate integer here and then sum all these uh, infinite series of delta functions okay so what i often see at the exam is something like this so This cannot be correct right because this is only one delta you clearly need the sum over here to tell that there is an infinite series of delta functions one corresponding to each k here where k is an integer value so this Dirac comb this Peigne de Dirac will be used in 
section of five when we will talk about sampling theory and when we'll talk about sampling theory well the t here will be the sampling period and what we'll do is multiply a function f of t with this Dirac comb okay so let's write that down so this is the sum going from minus infinity to infinity of delta t minus k t s well this is a sum over k though so you can also take the sum and take it inside so you obtain a sum from minus infinity to infinity of f of t delta t minus k t s okay so since you are not experts with the sifting property you can rewrite this what you have here is a delta that is located in t equals to k t s okay so you can rewrite this as well the same delta but modulated by the function where the delta is located so it's f of k t s right going from here to here that's the sifting property and of course you have to put the sum over here so this is how it looks like mathematically and this is what we'll use later on in the course we can also have a look at how it looks like with curves okay so let us take a function f of t right and I'll put it over here so that's my f of t so I can draw my Dirac comb I will not draw all of them so the spacing here is ts right and this formula says that if you multiply this function with the Dirac comb okay I should do something like this what you obtain is a sum of Dirac combs that are spaced also by ts but that are modulated by the function so it looks like something like this and this will be useful because you can see here what you're actually doing is sample the signal f of t at the sampling instance k times ts okay so as i've said we'll talk about that again in section five let us talk about energy and power in the context of signal processing in this context the energy is defined using this formula so we need to take the continuous time signal square it and integrate it over uh, time you see here that we need to take the modulus before squaring this is because we have the possibility that the signal f of t might be complex valued okay the energy in this signal processing context is not the same as the conventional notion of energy in physics but you can make the link the conventional energy in physics i'll write it like that would be the energy as defined over here and you would have to divide by z where z is an impedance in the appropriate unit okay so let's take an example uh, let's take f of t which is a voltage and the impedance would be here so that would be expressed in volts right and the impedance would be a resistance and that would be expressed in ohms okay so if we look at the units of energy you would have volts squared times seconds 
okay so volts square times second this is not the usual unit for electrical energy but where if you look at this one over here you would have volts squared times second divided by ohms okay and this is the same units as volts times amps times seconds and this is indeed the unit of joule okay so in signal processing will say that the energy is defined like this if you're looking for the conventional notion well you have to do something like this over here so in the concept of signal processing again you can compute the average power you know that power is energy over time so without a surprise the power is computed like this okay so you integrate from minus t over 2 to t over 2 you divide by t and you let t tend to infinity so this is for general continuous time signals if the signal is periodic of period t well you can just integrate the modulus of the function eh? Here again we are considering potentially complex valued function the modulus of the function squared over one period and divide by the period okay so again this is the power here computed in a signal processing framework if you're looking for the conventional notion of power in physics well you can make the link again and i'll write it like this okay the conventional power in physics well you have to take the power as defined in a signal processing framework and divide by this notion of impedance in the right units so again if we take our example of voltage okay so expressed here in volts the impedance will be here a resistance expressed in ohm right the power as defined in this course will have units volts squared okay so this is not the units of power as you're used to in physics courses right but if you take the power as defined over here you'll have volts squared per ohm okay and this has units of volts times amps and these are watts okay so there is a link between the power average power computed as in signal processing and the conventional notion of power in physics so if signals have a finite energy okay they are called finite energy signals or square integrable signals and here you have two examples of finite energy signals okay remember this rectangular impulse and if you compute the energy well i think it's kind of obvious here you will see that it's one okay and you can also compute the energy for this exponentially decreasing uh, impulse and you will see that it's a one over 2a and i will leave this as an exercise okay another comment that we can make if a signal has a finite energy its associated power will automatically be zero because you need to take this limit over here where this quantity here is finite okay so by definition it will always be zero we can also speak about finite power signals and obviously these signals have finite average total power the first example is the unit step and if you apply the formula you will see that p is equal to a half okay 
So it's a straightforward application of the formula. So I'll leave it as an exercise. Uh, second example is this periodic uh, signal that switches between 0 and 1 and you'll obtain the same average total power which is a half and again I'll leave it as an exercise. In general you can say that finite power signals and we'll assume here that the power is positive well they always have an infinite total energy and a good example of that is periodic signals. If you would compute the total energy of this periodic signal you would end up with an infinite energy so this is an application of what is written over here so as an example we can compute the average total power of a sinusoidal signal uh, the period of this sinusoidal signal is t over here so we apply the formula it's 1 over the period and we integrate the square here we simply the square because it's a real valued signal over one period okay so the easiest thing here is to take a period from 0 to t and we square this signal and this is what we obtain so here is a good reminder for trigonometry so we can use the Carnot formula which says that 2 times sine alpha squared is 1 minus the cosine of 2 alpha. Okay, and if you use that and you stick it in here, this is what you obtain. Then you integrate, after integration, this is what you obtain, and the integration limits are 0 to t, so this will yield here t and this is what we obtained for the average total power so now we can define what is called the root mean square value or the rms value in french it's called la valeur efficace and it's simply the value of the constant signal that would have same average power as the sinusoidal signal and this value is simply the well, amplitude divided by the square root of 2. So the last subsection of section 2 is a subsection on complex exponentials. It's an important subsection because it will have, well, quite a few applications in the rest of the course. So we'll start with the sine and cosine. And if you remember, we had written down the Euler identity okay and it says the following plus j sine theta so this is a complex number under polar form and you can view it as a vector and the vector as length one this is the modulus and the direction is given by theta, which is the argument of here. So you can see this as a rotating vector. Uh, you will see this in the animation. When theta is changing, well, the direction of the vector is changing, and you'll see this as a rotating vector. Well, if you take this vector and you project it on the real axis, what you'll obtain is a cosine if you project it on the imaginary axis you'll obtain a sine okay so this is indeed a complex exponential signal but if you project it on the real axis you obtain a cosine and if you project it on the imaginary axis you obtain a sine so let's have a look at the animation so you see here that the vector eg theta is indeed a rotating vector so if you look at the projection on the real axis you obtain the cosine as indicated and if you project it on the imaginary axis you obtain a sine so this is how you can obtain a sine and a cosine from a complex exponential signal eg theta 
Well, there is a second interpretation of the sine and the cosine, and it also involves complex in exponentials. Okay, so we we'll start using the same Euler identity, eg theta is equal to cosine theta plus j sine theta. Okay, so if we write e to the minus j theta, okay, we had seen this, we can rewrite it as this with a minus sign here, and there you have minus j sine theta. So if you sum this, okay, and you divide by two, you obtain this equation here. And if you, if you take the difference and you divide by two j, you obtain this relation over here. And what this says, for instance, is that a cosine can be seen as a rotating vector eg theta plus a rotating vector e minus j theta divided by 2. So this one will be rotating counterclockwise and this one will be rotating clockwise. And if you take the vector sum of these two rotating vectors, you obtain a cosine. Well, there is also another interpretation, a similar interpretation for the sine, but there you have to take the difference. Okay, Here you divide by 2, here you have to divide by 2j. So let us look at this second animation huh, concerning this second interpretation of a sine and cosine. So what you see here are two rotating vectors. They have amplitude one half. There is one rotating counterclockwise is eg theta. And there is one that is rotating clockwise. It's e to the minus j theta. If you take the vector sum of these two uh, rotating vectors, you obtain a cosine. And if you take the vector difference, you obtain a sign. So let us look at the complex exponential that is written over here. Okay, so it's a bit more complicated than the one that we had considered uh, previously. Now remember that we have considered the following complex exponential. Uh, we had seen that it was a rotating uh, vector and that you could construct sines and cosines from it. Okay, so here we have this more general complex exponential where A, capital A, is written as a complex number under polar form. K here is the modulus of A and phi here is the argument of capital A. And the lowercase a will also be written as a complex number but in Cartesian form. So sigma zero is the real part of lowercase a and omega zero here is the imaginary part. Okay, so now you can rewrite this complex exponential. So this is a over here and here you have the exponential of a t. Okay, so we have reviewed the properties of the exponential so you can rewrite the exponential like so and then you can regroup everything here we have j and you have j over here so you can regroup things like this okay so this exponential here looks a lot like this one and we have something in front over here remember that this thing here using the Euler identity you can rewrite like this. So this is my complex exponential. It's a complex signal. But if you map everything on the real axis, what you'll have is, well, this thing over here. So this is the real part of f of t. Okay, so this is mapping on the real axis and if you map everything on the imaginary axis you'll have something similar an imaginary part of f of t will be k e sigma zero t and then sine 
omega zero t plus phi. Okay, so let's for instance take this one over here. Okay, so it's the real part of this complex exponential. Well, obviously, this is a cosine, but it's well, there is a phase shift because of this phi over here. It's multiplied by a constant k, and there is also an exponential here in front. Okay, so if the sigma here is negative, what you'll have is a decaying exponential that is going to multiply a cosine. Okay, if sigma zero is positive, you will have a growing exponential that will be multiplying a cosine. Okay, so you see here that the k in the complex number uh, capital A here will multiply the signal. The phi over here, and that's the argument of capital A, will, will cause a phase shift in the cosine. And then you have to take the lowercase a. Well, the real part uh, will influence the exponential here. And depending on the sign of this one, you'll have a growing or a decaying exponential. And the imaginary part of lowercase a will influence the frequency of the cosine. So let us look at an example where both capital A and lowercase a are real. So a is k e g phi. So if capital A is real, it means that phi is equal to zero and a is sigma zero plus j omega zero so if it, it's real it means that omega zero is equal to zero so this complex exponential just becomes a, a real exponential and depending on the sign on sigma zero you'll have a decaying or an well, growing exponential. If sigma zero, in this case, a is negative, the exponential is decreasing, it's decaying. If sigma zero, in this case, a is larger than zero, you have something that is exponentially increasing, growing. And if a is equal to zero, well, you have a constant signal. So let's just have a look at the case where you have purely imaginary exponentials. So in this case, a is real. So again, we have phi is equal to zero. And this time, lowercase a is equal to sigma zero plus j omega zero. It's purely imaginary. So sigma zero is equal to zero. Okay. And if we plug that in inside this complex exponential this is what we obtain and this looks a lot like what we've seen in the animation right if you set that to, to omega zero times t you have what you see in the animation and then if you take the real part of this complex signal you have a cosine this multiplied by a gain right and if you take the imaginary part well you have a sign okay well one other thing that you could do is take this signal and add its complex conjugate the complex conjugate of this one will be the same exponential but with a minus sign okay so if you add the complex conjugate and you divide by two you have also the cosine okay so taking the real part well this was the first animation and adding the complex conjugate and divide by two that's the second animation that was shown to you so if we take the general case where capital a is complex and in polar form and lowercase a is also complex and in cartesian form you can rewrite this complex exponential in the following way okay this is something that we have done previously and we had already seen that 
well you can construct this signal by taking the real part of this complex exponential and you can obtain this signal over here by taking the imaginary part these signals are real exponentials modulated by cosine and sine okay well it is also possible to obtain these signals differently by taking well f of t and adding or subtracting the complex conjugate okay so the complex conjugate of this signal will be exactly the same but i will have a change of sign over here okay so if you add f of t and its complex conjugate the signs will disappear over here and i can construct a cosine by taking this sum and dividing by 2 you'll have something similar here for this expression by by taking the difference okay so this is f of t and this is its complex conjugate so it involves an exponential of a t and here it is involves an exponential of the conjugate of a times t so a is sigma 0 plus j omega 0 so a conjugate will be sigma 0 minus j omega 0 so as a conclusion a real exponential modulated by sine or a cosine can be constructed using two complex exponentials we had already seen this for the cosine and the sine okay so it's worthwhile coming back to this slide once we will have taken the Laplace transform of this signal over here and this signal over here. Because when we'll consider this Laplace transform and we'll consider the poles of these Laplace transforms, we'll see that the poles are sigma 0 plus j omega 0 and sigma 0 minus j omega 0 okay so there is a clear link with what we see here this real exponential modulated by a sine and cosine can be constructed using two complex exponential and this is why later the laplace transform of this type of signal will have poles located in a and a conjugate well let us have a look at what type of signals we can generate using this complex exponential okay remember that capital a and lowercase a are complex one is in polar form the other one is in cartesian form okay and we have seen that we had obtained an expression and if you take well the imaginary part of this complex signal you obtain something like this okay so what kind of signal do you have well depending on the sign of sigma zero uh, sigma zero is indeed the real part of a here if the sigma zero is negative okay so you'll have something that is exponentially decreasing and the blue curve is an example of that you have a sign times an exponential that is decreasing so the exponential will give the envelope and in between these two envelopes you'll have your sign and the amplitude will decrease exponentially if this sigma zero is positive well you have the green line and the envelope will be exponentially uh, increasing okay so it's worthwhile looking at the influence of the four parameters well k obviously will come and multiply the signal phi over here will cause a phase shift sigma zero will actually say if this exponential is decreasing or increasing and omega zero will will change the frequency of the sign in this case that you see here on the screen so what we'll do here is using a little simulink simulation show 
what we can obtain using this type of complex exponential okay and remember that we had rewritten it as e k e sigma zero t times cosine omega zero t plus v plus j sine omega zero t plus v okay so what you see here is these signals here being constructed so here you have the sigma zero this is the clock so this will give me the t over here this is the exponential and this is the e sigma zero t over here this one here we have well the frequency times time plus phi so this signal here is omega zero t plus phi right then it goes into a cosine and a sine i will be showing these two signals and, and i will also show this in an xy plot so this will kind of show me the rotating phaser okay so we'll take different cases over here in this case we have a fixed uh, frequency and we can have a look at what will happen if we take well, sigma zero is equal to zero and then we'll take it slightly negative slightly positive and what we can do also is take in zero frequency if we take a zero frequency this term will disappear here this will become a one and then we'll have just real exponentials so let us take an example where sigma zero is equal to zero so e to the sigma zero t is one so we will have cosine and sine of a fixed amplitude so let's have a look at what happens over here so in yellow you have the cosine in purple the sine and what you've got here is the rotating vector if you project it on the real axis you have the yellow curve and if you project it on the imaginary axis you have the uh, sign okay so what we can do is maybe leave it like that and change the frequency okay and we'll let's say double it and so it's omega zero it's here in radians per second let's approximately double it and let's have a look at what happens and you will see that the frequency will change okay so if i change my omega zero indeed the frequency has changed so i've brought the original frequency and i can change now my sigma zero and let's make it slightly negative so we should have an exponentially decaying exponential that will be modulated by cosines and sines let's have a look so you see again the two signals and the phaser and you see that the length of the phaser is exponentially decreasing and if you map it to the real axis and imaginary axis well you obtain these two signals and you can see that their amplitude is exponentially decaying so instead of taking a negative sigma zero i uh, will make it slightly positive and well we should have exponentially growing signals okay so you see that the length of the phaser is exponentially growing and you see the same thing happening on the cosine and sine you see here that the amplitude is indeed exponentially growing so what we can do next is maybe take a zero frequency over here so sigma zero is still positive so we expect here to see an exponential that is growing okay so it is indeed the case the frequency is zero so the cosine will give a 
one okay and it's modulated by an increasing exponential so indeed we see this signal over here the sign will always and the imaginary part will always be zero and indeed if we take a zero frequency we have a signal that is real and in this case exponentially growing so if we take it negative it should be exponentially decreasing okay so this concludes this section two on well basic signals and their properties